name's Art, and um, uh, I've been here since uh, June of '94. And, uh, and so, yeah, we're in, in the Ocean Abalone Farm. We uh, we have a hatchery over in Moss Landing. Did you guys stop at Moss Landing? Uh, next, next, next. Okay, all right. Uh, so we have a, a hatchery and, and the wet lab, and then the nursery tanks outside. Our, our, everything we have up there now is in the nursery tanks. Um, and when the apps are about 25 millimeters or so in shell length, we'll bring them over. They're a good size to to uh, eat seaweed at that point, and uh, they hit the cages and they, they start growing pretty fast for an abalone. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and so uh, then we we sell most of our the, the smallest size we sell is about a, uh, about three and a half inches in shell length, quarter pound of live weight. And, and uh, the restaurants really like that size. Uh, we also sell to, you know, to, just to the general public, and they most of them want the biggest abalone they can get. That's what they, you know, they think about when they think about abalone is, you know, something this big. So, uh, unfortunately, that would take us about 10 years to produce, and so that's not going to work for us. But uh, tasty hors d'oeuvres and tasty and hors and, yeah. and 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 things that we get to make other parts of the meal with. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, so uh, we harvest kelp from uh, the kelp beds here, mostly uh, off of Pacific Grove, and uh, <clears throat> we harvest about, uh, you know, for feeding the whole farm, we're going to harvest about a good five tons a week. Uh, five tons a week. Five, five wet tons of kelp a week. And of course, kelp is you know, about 80% water weight, uh, but, but still, it's a lot of kelp, and it's a lot of work to harvest it, and the way we farm Five millimeter abs that fit about up to five, six thousand in a cage. And when when uh, the biggest size we sell is a one pound per a one pound abalone, it's about six inches, about five and a half to six inches shell length, and do make at, at most two hundred in a cage that size. So uh, they start eating, they grow. We have to thin them out and move them to different cages uh, to spread them out and get them to grow and. And then also uh, just to you know keep them growing faster, so they have enough. You know, ideally, they're uh, you know yeah, a certain a certain density below which or above which uh, growth rate becomes slower. And, and uh, yeah, so uh, we also do so we'll, at, at a certain point, maybe when they're when they're about almost three inches in shell length, we will sort out the, the biggest abalone and set those aside for fast growth. And uh, they, and then we'll sell them to bigger sizes, starting at about a half a pound up to a pound. And so they'll, they'll get an additional one to three years of, of culture. And yeah, so besides that, we also uh, sometimes bring in some live shellfish like sea urchin, uh, whelks, sea cucumber that we get from divers mostly in the Channel Islands. Um, and sometimes spiny lobster we try to set, you know, as a little sideline. And we also uh, do some scientific collecting for research and education. We we'll collect various organ, you know, things for public aquaria or for laboratories. Uh, a lot of a lot of sea urchins, a lot of gravid sea urchins for embryology labs stuff like that uh, and uh, yeah uh, so those are our main sources of income and you guys I uh, I've also mentioned you guys um, started pioneering that idea of sort of silaging sil the right. the kelp for the dry times of the year do you want to talk about that at all yeah yeah so that was one of the uh, really uh, a big uh, concern um, so probably 15 years ago right or more uh, 20 years ago uh, and then you know because in a bad winter you can lose all your you know 90 percent of the kelp can be gone by the end of october so we had a big big storm in october and, and we lost it, it, it hit us hard we had big swells and 
<clears throat> and especially here, it's you know if it's westerly, you know, so the the peninsula kind of curves around and it's almost northerly at the tip of it, and so we're protected from west swell, but northwest or, or north swell is it's really tough on the, on the kelp beds, and uh, and so uh, we were. You know, we're just thinking like, man, you know, maybe we can't, you know, grow as many, support as many abalone as we want to. And we were talking to uh, Professor Mike Graham up at Mossland Marine Lab, a mycologist, and he said, well, we, you can dry the seaweed, get it down to about 30% of its wet weight, and then pack it in a plastic bag, we, uh, and uh, suck all the air out of it. The bacteria will absorb, they'll go, you know, they'll, they'll metabolize and use up the oxygen, it'll go anaerobic will drop and only the anaerobic bacteria will be in there and they work much more slowly and he said yeah this is silage this is what dairy farms do when you go by a dairy farm you'll see a huge mound with tarp and tires on it and that's the same it's alfalfa but they do the same thing they let it dry out in the fields and then they put it under the tarp and it seals it up so uh, it works great it looks great and, and we've uh, so we did that for a few years, and then uh, a guy who was working here said, well, what about, you know, it was a lot of work to dry it. That was, that was the hard part. We had a little structure out here, and we would hang it up. And you don't want it to get too dry, because kelp, when it gets too dry, it gets like tissue paper, it just crumbles. And so uh, you had to watch it and just go around, and you know, some pieces were dry, and some pieces weren't. And so he had the idea of uh, using salt to pull the water out. So we would harvest it into one container and then we would have one guy putting it into another container and as he did we'd sprinkle salt on it. And that draws the water right out and uh, and it actually I think it helps to preserve it a little better. And so like, we've had batches that we've opened up two or three years later. And there can be a nasty layer on top where you're, you know there's a little hole or something and get some air. But underneath that you scrape that off. And it's, it's amazing. It's a, it's a great product. And, so the, and, the, and there's something about it that's very attractive to the Avalon. They, they, they really like to eat it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, and it, it's been doubly important for us because uh, in, what, I guess it was 2006 when the Marine Life Protection Act happened, something like oh, that. Oh, the MPAs, Marine, MPA yeah, stuff, yeah. The MPA, so, we, there used to be no MPAs, from, you know, around here. Actually, there was one. There was a Hopkins had Marine a, Station. A, yeah. Marine Station had an MPA. Uh, it was pretty small. But it's, but it's super little, and it was for research. I mean, it wasn't really yeah. massive impact. Right. So, with the MLPA, basically the whole I mean, from this uh, breakwater all the way out to Point Pinos and around Point Pinos, there are a series of MPAs. Uh, two of which allow kelp harvesting that's our marine conservation areas. Uh, but so our the area that we have for harvesting kelp now is much reduced. So we, we have we're more vulnerable to any kind of disturbances like winter storms or urchin urchin predation or whatever urchin grazing. And uh, and important to say these guys have to be proximate, right? If it's on if it's down in Santa Barbara. Maybe as an emergency or something, but they, they need to get it, you know, five tons a week, right? So that that's you want it nearby your operations right, nearby too. Your operation. that's, that's exactly right. And so actually, I'm supposed to be on a call about the social economic system or kelp something <laughs> this afternoon, and that's what I'm gonna say. You know what? You guys got to be careful when, when you're planning, making plans about kelp, and you know, people who you know, if there are people who need it. Then you know, don't pan them into too small of an area because you, you know you're going you're to crush them. You know? and so, anyway, uh, uh, yeah, and, and uh, <clears throat> marine aquaculture in California is is a uh, well. When I started uh, in '94, there were eight permitted abalone farms that were actually producing abalone, and there were five more that had recently gotten permits, so maybe they got their permits in 95 or something like that. And now there are three functioning farms in California. And, uh, so there's you guys. There's us. There's the culture of abalone in Goleta. Okay, right, yeah, yeah. And then there's American abalone up in Davenport. 
Oh, I don't know about that one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's another, uh, uh, they have a seawater intake. It used to be a salmon ranch. It was kind of, it was called Super hmm. King or something like hmm. that. You know, where they grew the smolts and then released them into the ocean and then swim back up. So, uh, so when folks like, like, and I, I don't mean to, you maybe don't know, I don't, I don't mean for you to speak for other folks, but uh, so with the abalone farm, they have a huge, or I assume they had a huge inventory and to shut up, did they, have they dispersed that to you guys or other people or what, what's up with all the animals in there? Well, they sold them all. They sold them all off. What, what I understand is that the, the, the person who, they, they were leasing the land from a gentleman, uh, and they have been leasing there since 78. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I thought it was, they started in the late 60s, I Maybe thought. it was. Uh, so yeah. Something like that. And, and unfortunately, that gentleman passed away. And his children said, you know. Uh, oh, we, really? We, yeah, you know, you're whatever. Different use. You guys, we want you out of here in 10 years. And oh, my God. Oh, okay, we'll be out of here in five years. And then they were gone in like three years. And they, they sold everything. Oh, my gosh. Just, they were done. And, uh, you know, I don't know exactly what their responsibilities are now. There, there are many people who are trying to save that. So it's really hard to get to find a coastal, piece of coastal Totally, property. totally. And it's very expensive. And then to get a permit from the Coastal Commission. Totally. To uh, put a seawater intake and a discharge in is just, it's like an act of God. And, and, uh, and one of the pro another issue is the... Uh, High cost of energy. Well, I, I was kind of friends with the manager. He told me they were paying fifty thousand dollars a month in, for, to PG. Yeah, and they and, and and they had a proposal to put up some uh, turbines and and solar stuff, yeah. but that got shut down because of you shit. So they said yeah. from PCH you'd be able to see it, so therefore you can't do it. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, what I heard was it was it was a view shed for people going by in boats. Oh, they they'd see a solar system up there. I can't have that. <laughs> I mean, it was. It was, uh, I don't know, anyway, so that's California. <laughs> that's California. And, uh, and we want you to have solar, but don't want you to have solar panels. Right, right. We don't have to see your solar panels. That's a terrible <laughs> idea. to be there. And, and we can, you know, especially if we're in our sailboat cruising down. That's a thing that would be. So, <laughs> so you guys are in the sweet position of not needing a seawater system right. because you guys are located underneath this municipal pier, which is pretty cool. Right. It is cool. And the pier is great because we can drive right up to the farm. We have electricity. We have fresh water. We have a roof over our heads down there when it's raining. <laughs> it's a nice and shady, which the abalone like. Uh, we've got pretty decent current flow through here. It can get kind of stagnant in the summer. Uh, we get some, we've been seeing more and more red tides. And of course, we're in the corner of the, of the bay here of this harbor. And so stuff tends to get stuck in here. Until, until the wind comes up. Uh, 2007, we lost uh, $60,000 worth of abalone to a red tide. Uh, and that was unfortunately, yeah. Uh, this year, we lost $5,000 worth of abalone because there was a huge squid harvest in the year. And there was apparently no squid from anywhere else. And the, there wasn't squid in the Channel Islands. There wasn't squid Right, 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 right. No, I know that. So they, they catch the squid, they pump it into their hole, and the squid can hit the hole and they ink. You know, they're freaking right, out. Right, right. And so when they, so the, the squid are in this hole full of ink water. And they're, so they're supposed to pump, as they, as they pump the squid out, they're pumping up the, the ink water and the squid, and, the, and the, the, the unloader has to have a tank to hold that black water. And, uh, and then they pump them. Once the hole is empty, then they pump the black water back into the hole. They're supposed to go three miles offshore and pump it out. Well, they were pumping it out right here, right here. Uh, you know, uh, one Sunday night, we pulled 1,500 tons, and within four days, we have 5,000 abalone dead. Uh, and everyone was like, I didn't, it was not me. And, and, and I'm going, look, you know, 
all this black water and the processors go, well, you know, it's it's the boats. And they, I go, You're, these boats are contracted to you. You're a company, you guys have a contract. They're fishing for you. Don't tell me you can't tell them what to do. You know, and so I still have a little heat about it. So, so, so you guys didn't, they didn't, yeah, they didn't yeah. give you guys a payment or anything? No, I mean, it's like, well, prove which boat it was, you know, I mean, it's, so anyway, uh, it was, anyway, some of, these are just some, some of the joys. Of some of the excitement, excitement yeah, of right. Avalanche. And then how has, how has COVID been? Have people been buying more, different amounts? Like what, what how did, how has that whole last uh, year played out COVID for you guys? been, uh, yeah, it's been a challenge. Uh, so the, the restaurants all, all shut down in March of 2020. Which we is a selling, huge market for you guys. Yeah, that was 90% of our, or more of our sales. And uh, so we said, well, we gotta, we gotta get to, to direct to the public. That's because people were, you know, everybody started, wow, I'm gonna cook at home. Right, <laughs> right, right, totally, yeah. totally. And so, uh, yeah, we were lucky to find a couple of guys who were, you know, had relationships in the Asian community in, in the South, uh, San Francisco Bay Area. And they had big lists, like hundreds of people that they would pitch to, you know, like in restaurants as well, they would pitch uh, special ingredients, special kinds of rice and special ingredients for cool. Asian cooking. And, uh, and so those guys really helped us a lot. They really helped us a lot. Uh, and then we were lucky enough to get uh, a couple of people to and, uh, So, but volume-wise, it was a fourth of what you were normally selling a typical year? It was half, like, what, what, yeah, like roughly? A third. A third, okay. Yeah. Okay. But we had the PPD loans, and we, were, and we, got, we kept, you know, figured out our social distancing thing for the crew, and we were able to feed the abalone and pay our crew, and the abalone just grew. And, and uh, so we, we were, you know, our inventory was in great shape when things reopened a year later. Two pounds um, special. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. No, no. <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah, so, so that's kind of... And things uh, now are kind of back to more a normal November, let's say, or not really? Well, uh, yeah, more or less. I mean, I, I thought... October is usually one of the strongest months, and you know I think. Uh, huh. Really. Uh, here, I mean. It, it, I would have thought summer with all the tourists and well, stuff. Well, summer. I mean, yeah, summer is very strong, and I think October is more of a crowd. that's like you know, God, the kids are back in school. Let's go, let's go somewhere for the weekend. Okay. Or whatever, you know? Okay. And uh, so we didn't have that this this year, which I thought was interesting, um, and uh, so it was. That's kind of summer was was quite strong, but then October went went down. Okay. And so far this month is is about it's down as well, but we're you know surviving. We're surviving, yeah, yeah, we're surviving. Which is which is a huge hallmark in the mariculture industry, it is. particularly it in is. California. Yeah, and it, and yeah, and 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 the industry's not growing because fish and wildlife has not has not. Uh, allowed or authorized a new water bottom lease in the state in over 20 years and uh, I think that's due to primarily to the reaction of people who didn't like salmon farming and then salmon farming became synonymous with aquaculture and uh, even so now that I mean, Even seaweed farming or shellfish farming, uh, which are both very green, uh, both of which remove nutrients from which are in excess. So that's why we have those red tides, and they combat uh, ocean acidification. Um, but they they're, they're saying, well, we need we they're develop, trying to develop a programmatic EIR uh, for aquaculture, which. Uh, it's been in the works for more than 20 years. For more than 20 years. I mean, it's, it's, they, they got one, Fish and Wildlife, which is the lead agency for aquaculture in California. They have one guy, you know, like the head guy, and then he has an assistant, and that's it. So it's, it's fresh water and, and, sea, and marine aquaculture in the whole state. Uh, this year they got, you know, 
gov where California's government is handing out billions. Fish and Wildlife got, I don't know, several hundred million dollars. They get nothing to hunt and fish. Zero. And it's, it's so, it's frustrating. And, uh, but there we are. And we're lucky <laughs> to be here, you know, we, we had this, this place. When, when we started here, we didn't have a, uh, you know, we were sort of supposedly working under the city's uh, coastal development permit from the Coastal Commission. Oh, you were? Okay. Yeah, but then the Coastal Development Permit said, no, you guys are, you know, you guys different are... Different enough? Yeah, different enough. You need to get your own. So we got our own, and uh, we, were, we were lucky we were able to do that without the benefit of a consultant or lawyers or anything like that. Um, and so we're hanging in there. Cool. Uh, yeah. I love it. Yeah, and so I know that Kate, Kate was going to take you guys go downstairs with you guys and, and show you around so you don't have to listen to me much longer. <laughs> and, uh, awesome. So about 300 okay, perfect. Thank you, sir. And we get about, I don't know, a couple tons of kelp every week. Um, maybe 24 cages a week. And uh, it's mostly macro fiscus. We have about three kelp beds that we harvest from um, along down that way, about past the rainwater. And we're able to feed our whole farm with about 25 to 30 cages because we got 200,000 uh, hungry abalone that, that we did all Wait. Yeah, so our food is all here. Uh, yeah, if you want to come see the farm, I can take you down this way. Yeah, lots of stuff around. Uh. So, the farm consists of six walkways. Each one has two rows of uh, pages. And every line you see with a clip there, that's one of our abalone cages, like the new one you saw upstairs. We have like 250 cages, about 200,000 abalone, and we start them off about an inch big. Um, we spawn them out in Moss Landing, and then when they get about an inch big, we put them down on row 12 at the very end. And as they get bigger, we start thinning them and moving them forward. Uh, so here we'll have our bigger abalone, like our half pounders. I don't know if you saw on our menu, we have like six year olds, seven year old, eight year olds. Uh, that's, this is the row where you, where you find those big abalone. And, um, I got a few here. Once they get to like a harvestable size, then we put them in these harvest barrels. Um, this one's almost empty, but we got some third pounders in here. Um, cool. Cool. Sorry, sorry, sorry. This is Rory. He's another one of our farmers. Nice. He's harvesting abalone nice. right now. Are those 95? 95 millimeter and 50 or 85 millimeter. Yeah. Cool. So we got a few different sizes. I'll let him put those. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. So if you guys. I don't know if you've already held abalone today, but um, they have not. They have not. Great. If you want to hold an abalone, I could pass it around. Um, anyone want to? Start? Who wants a tickle? Who wants yeah, a tickle? Yeah, uh, you can see okay. how much the water foot is. Um, they might lack plenty. This one just harvested, so it might be a little slimier. But uh, yeah, they've got this super muscular foot that allows them to hold on tight when a predator is going at them, or in the intertidal zone when they don't want to get washed away by the way. <laughs> Yeah, and these are their respiratory pores up here, so everything happens oh, out of those. Let's They've try. got... Let's try the left. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Kate, these What's are the 85s, right? Those are 95s. Okay, 95s. Okay. 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 Yeah, so... You said you mostly harvest macrocystis? Yeah, macrocystis. What else do you guys um, get? When we can, when it's really abundant, we'll get narrocystis. Um, it is closed, I think, in the summer, maybe like April to August, something like that. Close, so. You guys don't do any reds? or I thought you guys augment with... It's hard to harvest them um, because you, you really need to be diving or in a tide pool to get reds. And, um, our divers with, with macrocystis, they can just reach over the side of the boat and cut a few feet off of the canopy and then it grows back in a few days. So um, that's the most, I think, efficient way for us to feed our farm because they can go out on a trip for like an hour or two hours and come back with, you know, a ton of health on the right. boat. Um, right. Where if you're scuba diving, it's a lot, a lot slower uh, getting that red algae.